Welcome to DEF CON Group's VR Village for DEF CON 31. I'm X-Ray, your host. I'm from DC 404 in Atlanta, Georgia. Our next speaker is Sam C. Sam is presenting, hey, crypto bro, how are criminals laundering, monetizing, and targeting cryptocurrency, NFTs, and smart contracts? For this presentation, Sam will be covering some of the methods of launching mixers, tumblers, over-the-counter exchanges, peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, and high-risk exchanges, as well as how to treat, how, sorry, how threat actors monetize their illicit digitizing profits by utilizing virtual credit cards, account cash-out services, and more. Next, Sam will analyze and discuss the attack vectors utilized by threat actors to target cryptocurrency, non-fungible tokens, and smart contracts. He will also discuss popular attack vectors, such as airdrops, cross chain bridge attacks, rug pulls, wallet compromises, flash loans attacks, smart contract vulnerabilities, API withdrawals, drainers, and notable incidents that highlight successful laundering and monetization activities via cryptocurrencies. And no, I didn't say that all in one breath. Finally, Sam will discuss how threat actors will likely evolve and transform their laundering and monetizing methods and attack vectors targeting cryptocurrency. NFTs and smart contracts. Uh, Sam is from DC 412 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, United States. Currently working a record future, uh, a rec sorry, a recorded future. Sam's areas of focus and interest include the cryptocurrency, NFT, and smart contract space, the Russian and English lang language cybercrime ecosystem, and threat actor management research. He has previously worked as a cyber threat intelligence analyst and researcher at Aon Kroll, Ter, uh, Terbarium Labs, and National Cyber Forensics and Training Alliance. Prior to starting his career, he attended Duquesne University. I had to look up how to pronounce that, by the way. He attended Duquesne University and earned a BA in political science. Afterwards, he attended the University of Pittsburgh's Graduate School for International Affairs and earned a Master of Arts in Security and Intelligence Studies. So give a warm welcome to Sam uh, and take it away, Sam. Sam is on mute. Oh. So Sam is getting ready. Uh, wait a minute, your slide deck is on screen right now. Okay, let's see what's going on here. Hmm. All right, they seem to be having technical problems. I'm not sure what it is. All right, can everyone hear me now? I think we should. Yes. Be yep, we can hear you. We're good. We just had to get a good old refresh on this. All right, so. 
I'm going to, my name is Sam. Uh, I am a threat intelligence analyst as was described at Recorded Future. Um, I'm going to be going through quite a bit in this presentation. Um, so I'm gonna try to cover it all in an hour. Uh, I attempted a B-sides in Pittsburgh, got very, very close. I uh, had to cut it short a little bit at the end there. So um, next slide, please. Uh, well, some of the first things I'm going to do here, uh, I'm going to go over some definitions of crypto uh, within the space. I know there's varying levels of understanding and varying levels of interest within the space. So I just want to kind of get everyone on a basic uh, play, playing field here on understanding how uh, all of these terms and kind of basic terminology. Then we're going to go over a few laundering methods of cryptocurrency. And I just wanted to kind of caveat this at the beginning. This is not the end all be all of laundering methods. There are some additional ones that may not be included. Um, these are kind of the most popular ones that we've seen, especially within our research and interacting with threat actors. Then we're gonna go into some of the monetization money, uh, monetization methods within the cryptocurrency space that we're seeing threat actors using. Next, we're gonna go over some of the uh, attacks and other threats to cryptocurrency, NFTs, and smart contracts. Again, this will not be a kind of an end all be all. This is very much a highlight and overview of some of the most popular attack vectors that we're seeing against these specific entities. And then we're going to attempt to look into the future a little bit. Uh, and with this, we're going to attempt to kind of analyze and predict possibly where this may go and where this may head. So next slide, please. So I just wanted to put this quote up from uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, maybe one person, maybe a group of individuals that initially created Bitcoin back in 2009. I just want to put this quote up because I think it encapsulates a lot of what this talk is about. Uh, it was about creating and this, this token, uh, you know, aside from regulation, aside from financial institutions, aside from governments. And that was the big kind of thing that was meant to be within its specifically the space of Bitcoin. And I think what is happening specifically within this space and what we're going to talk about today, again, very much encapsulates that kind of skirting regulations, getting past a lot of what has been put in place for the traditional financial systems that we have. Next slide, please. Awesome. So right now, uh, an altcoin. Uh, so an altcoin is any other token outside of Bitcoin. So those are things like Ethereum, Monero, Dogecoin. So you have all of those. Those are all altcoins. So anything outside of a Bitcoin is an altcoin. And then a Bitcoin is a Bitcoin. So it was the original decentralized currency uh, that was created in January of 2009 under the uh, pseudo name of uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, and again, it was we don't know if it's a group or one individual right now. Uh, it's up for debate on who it may be or who the group of individuals may be. And the ideas for Bitcoin and the original blockchain for it were actually written in a white paper about six months before uh, in October of, I'm sorry, I'm bad at math, it's way less than six months, in October 2008. Uh, and also laid out in that was blockchain. Uh, and what the blockchain is, it's a digital ledger that's unchangeable that's used to track transactions so what you have there is again something that is unchangeable i transacted with one individual it is there you cannot change it and i know a lot of technologies are you know attempting to move to that whether it's with smart contracts using blockchain technology with that so next we have a cold wallet i actually don't have mine with me but cold wallets are essentially offline hardware wallets and ledger and trezor are two of the most popular ones or you know, more of the popular ones that I've seen. And they essentially look like um, little flash drives almost. And you need it to be able to plug into your machine, which I have back there, to be able to unlock and send and receive transactions with that little cold wallet you need it plugged in. Um, next, we have uh, everyone's favorite here, uh, which is uh, a cryptocurrency exchange. So think Binance, uh, FTX, rest in peace. So uh, what these big exchanges are is they're centralized places for individuals. Uh, they're regulated. They have know your customer regulations. They have AML regulations. So again, these are the 
established, um, you know, have standard practices and standard operating procedures within them. And again, users create accounts here. They can store their crypto here. They can buy, sell, and uh, even cash out their crypto on these cryptocurrency exchanges, these uh, non-high risk ones and legitimate ones. Next, we have cryptocurrency mining. So I'm sure a lot of individuals remember the big boom for graphics cards uh, post COVID. That's what a lot of these uh, graphics cards went to was the actual process of mining cryptocurrency. And you need a massive amount of graphical uh, processing power to begin to mine and solve the computational problems that uh, make up the mining process. And they're essentially puzzles uh, that have, uh, that you need to create a hash value for to be able to complete the block and complete the transaction to get it to go through. And then you get a chunk of that, which is a mining fee. So you, everyone pays transaction fees when they transact in various cryptocurrencies. Next slide, please. So next we have uh, Ethereum request for comments 20. So I just wanted to throw this one in here. Um, we may not um, kind of get too deep into it, but essentially uh, what ECR 20 is, it's a standard basic set of guidelines that govern the Ethereum blockchain. So that includes everything on the Ethereum blockchain. So that is tokens, smart contracts, and NFTs. Uh, Ethereum is not the only token that is on the Ethereum blockchain. There uh, is also uh, Tether, um, testing my knowledge here if I remember correctly, I think um, Poly, uh, Polygon is also on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, but I have a whole list of those uh, I think at the end of this deck. Um, and next, uh, we're going to go into uh, fiat currency. When I first started researching cryptocurrency, I saw this word. I was like, what the hell is a fiat currency? I had no idea. I had to look it up. And essentially what a fiat currency is, is a currency that is issued by a government. Um, so think US dollar, think euro, um, think British pound. So you have all of those within the realm of fiat currency. And the goal within crypto um, a lot of the tokens that you have are very hard to monetize unless it touches the physical world. It touches that fiat currency. So we're going to attempt to kind of cover a lot of that in a little bit to see where we can go from digital to fiat. Um, next, we have Hot Wallet. So Hot Wallet is essentially a software wallet that you are storing, whether it is through Coinbase, whether it is through Exodus, whether it is through Electrum. Uh, those hot wallets uh, are a little bit more vulnerable to attack compared to cold wallets because they're stored on online. Um, you know, individuals are able to compromise them. You can get your private keys compromised for those hot wallets. It's a little bit less likely for cold wallets, again, because they are kept offline. You can kind of protect those a little bit more versus the hot. Um, then we have our favorite, our non-fungible token. So up in the corner there are... Uh, NFTs from the Board Ape Yacht Club. So I had never heard of the Board Ape Yacht Club until, again, I started researching a lot of this. I don't know why you would pay the exorbitant amounts of money for a picture of an ape, a cartoon ape. Uh, you know, the world is doing very well when people are paying several $100,000 for pictures of apes. Um, so essentially what an NFT is, uh, it is a unit uh, of value that's utilized to prove ownership of something. So you are proving on the blockchain because you paid for it or because you now own this, whether it is through a transfer or another transaction on the blockchain, it shows that you own this. And how that works is once the transaction is complete, you're assigned a hash value that no one else, I mean, any, anyone else can see the hash value, but you have ownership through it, through the blockchain. And those are hosted on the Ethereum blockchain. And then private keys, uh, think of those as essentially the keys to your house. So what you have with those private keys, you need them to be able to send and approve transactions, whether that's with your hot wallet or cold wallet. And we're actually going to see in a little bit how crucial those private keys are in the cryptocurrency ecosystem. Because if you lose control of those, you lose control of the funds or the asset that you have in your wallet or even in your DeFi platform uh, or kind of any other asset that you may have digitally within this space. Um, lastly, we have smart contracts. Um, I am not a mathematician at all. I don't necessarily understand smart contracts to the fullest extent of kind of what is possible. I understand them kind of in an intermediate and advanced um, 
uh, means. So smart contracts are basically software that uh, digitally facilitates or enforces a rules-based agreement or terms between transacting parties. So we're going to get into things like flash loans. Those are smart contracts that you're making with an individual or making with a, another platform. Um, you can also have individual smart contracts between users. Um, so when you go and uh, stake cryptocurrency, so it's essentially loaning cryptocurrency, whether it's to another individual or whether it's to a bigger, um, uh, bigger exchange, you are signing a smart contract staking, saying you are going to get interest or rewards for what you have put into their platform or loan to them. So again, that's some examples of a smart contract, some definitions. Um, now we're going to get into the fun stuff. Uh, next slide, please. So right here um, are some laundering methods of cryptocurrency. Apologies uh, if you can't see it. I've noticed that converting this from a Google PowerPoint to a Microsoft PowerPoint has changed all the fonts. Um, so what we have here are some of the privacy and security focused wallets. Where we came up with a piece of this list are various um, conversations we've had with threat actors. Uh, various uh, forum posts we've seen on high-level Russian forums, such as Exploit and XSS. We've seen various ransomware actors talking uh, about these, uh, specifically Lockbit, uh, Wasabi Wallet. They had very uh, openly called out on XSS at one point of, hey, we use this to store some of our funds that we've gathered from victims. Um, so again, this would be kind of the first layer or level is, they need a secure place to be able to even start the laundering process. So you, you would usually start with one of these wallets. Um, again, some of these are hot, some of these are cold wallets. Ledger and Trezor are both uh, cold wallets. The rest of them um, are hot wallets. And then that last one, Feather Wallet, is a Monero only wallet that we've seen some threat actors talk about. So next we have up um, in another method that we've seen and it's very interesting. I, I, it's kind of the, the wish.com of mixing, essentially. So what you have here are your cross-chain token swaps. So what you're doing is essentially converting. So say you get paid in Bitcoin and it's illicit or you want to anonymize it or you want to uh, obscure it. You're going to go from Bitcoin to, say, Monero to Ethereum back to Bitcoin. You're obscuring the uh, transaction. So if I can remember the saying correctly, it's uh, obscurity through or anonymity through obscurity. So you're essentially getting rid of the uh, traces that you had of the crypto from the original form and putting it back. Or you can go from Bitcoin to Monero to Ethereum to another uh, token like Doge, and you can cash out that way. Again, you're just obfuscating at this point. Next slide, please. Um, next, we have cryptocurrency mixers. So these are some of the more popular mixers that I not only use myself and kind of my day-to-day -day work, but some of the other things that we use um, that we've seen uh, criminals talk about uh, and threat actors talk about on the forums. Uh, the first one is Anani Mixer. Um, Anani Mixer, I absolutely love it. Whoever designed the user experience for this deserves the gold medal, star, whatever you want to call it. It is awesome. You put your address in. It tells you exactly the timeout. It tells you exactly the addresses you need to send things to. It even gives you a little letter of confirmation of this is how much I sent. If you ever have a dispute, you send that PDF to the administrators and then they either approve or refund you your transaction. They're very responsive. They're very good at maintaining and keeping this mixer up. This one is Tor only. They used to have a clearnet domain at one point unsure of what happened to it. It's unreachable at this point. So who knows if they took it down and just put it on tour permanently at this point. So again, these are common uh, mixers, at least to kind of kick off the laundering process. Um, I want to specifically call out Comedy Cash Out. And um, I don't think it's up there. No, I want, so I want to specifically call out Comedy Cash Out because you're going to see it again. Um, so what Comedy Cash Out is, is a um, over-the-counter type mixer. So what that means is these are individuals that don't necessarily have a UI or anything like that to use. What these mixers are is someone is doing the cross-chain swaps. They are swapping it out with a liquidity pool that they have or tokens that they have that they know are clean. And these are uh, Comedy Cash Out is specifically advertised on Exploit. 
and it even has a banner. It has, I'm sorry, it's specifically, yes, it's on exploit. It specifically has a banner. It has a ton of press. It has a ton of comments under the actual thread, positive reviews. They're doing very well in that sense um, uh, within the mixer space. And they also operate in exchange as well, which we'll get to in a little bit. But what I wanna call out are some of the, why this process, step in the process is important. Some of the largest cryptocurrency thefts and the funds stolen from them have gone through mixers. Uh, so Blender.io, uh, we're going to talk about the Ronin theft in a little bit, so keep that in mind. Blender.io was seized um, by an international law enforcement effort and sanctioned by OFAC. Tornado Cash was sanctioned by OFAC. Um, they did, they uh, cashed out funds from Harmony. Uh, you have Fox Mixer that was also uh, seized by law enforcement action. You have Chip Mixer uh, in Bizlato. Uh, so those were also involved within mixing and handling funds from whether it was ransomware or uh, illicit markets that were selling narcotics. Um, Biz, uh, Bizlato uh, was actually a Russian, um, uh, it was a Russian firm that was mixing a lot of funds for a lot of Russian based markets. Um, and then these, uh, some of uh, what we have here is they've, after these sanctions came down, we had kind of a revolution or evolution within this uh, space of laundering cryptocurrency. And that led to other things such as virtual credit cards, privacy and security focused wallets, uh, cross chain uh, token swaps. So again, just to avoid sanctions or to avoid hitting something that was sanctioned. Next slide, please. So right here, uh, we have other methods of laundering cryptocurrency. So this top one, um, these are very interesting to me, these peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, because this is essentially a trust between somebody that, hey, I want to do this for you. This is essentially a Craigslist type uh, service of you put an ad up and we'll see in the next slide, uh, don't go to it yet. Uh, we'll see in the next slide an example of what uh, one of these peer-to-peer -peer exchanges is. So what they are, um, they are exchanges to where users specifically post ads and interact with each other. They have extremely limited know your customer and anti-money laundering policies or requirements. Um, and what you have here, um, if we want to go to the next slide, I'll actually um, show you what one looks like. This is actually Agora Desk. Um, so what you have here is you have the seller on the furthest column to the right. You have the payment method the price that they'll sell you the Bitcoin at, and then the limits of what they will actually transact with. So again, you can do this. So say you uh, did a cross chain swap from Bitcoin to Monero back to Bitcoin. Say you want to clean it another step or add another step in the laundering process, you would possibly go to something like Agora Desk and start, uh, uh, start laundering through this method as well. So this is, again, another very interesting method um, there are a lot others. There's Peach Bitcoin, there's local Monero. So again, there's various peer-to-peer -peer exchanges for various tokens. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, I'm pretty sure Agoradesk does both Bitcoin and Monero. So again, this is peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, you create an account and then you go ahead and transact with that individual or trade with them. Uh, and there are options on some of them to even cash out to a um, fiat currency, which I think we may get to in another slide. Um, but I just want to touch on it real quick. We saw several ads for individuals that were willing to use peer-to-peer -peer exchanges or peer-to-peer -peer method to cash out to banks in Eastern Europe, such as Serb Bank and Tinkoff Bank. So we were saying, hey, if you are in Eastern Europe and you're a sanctioned uh, individual or your funds are frozen and you possibly want to get them out or you have Bitcoin, uh, or any type of crypto, if you send it to us, we'll get, send you a QR code that you can go to Tinkoff or Sir Bank and withdraw the funds. They'll be clean, untraceable. So again, there were several ads that we were seeing for some of these um, services outside of this. Um, next slide, please. So right here, um, so in addition to the other things that we've talked about, so the wallets, the cross-chain swaps, um, the peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. We also have high-risk exchanges. So you may be wondering, what is the difference between a high-risk and peer-to-peer -peer exchange? So a high-risk exchange here 
is think something similar to Binance or Coinbase. However, they operate with little to no KYC or AML. So you having similar functions to a Coinbase or to a Binance, you're getting similar services. However, you don't have to go through any of the BS of proving who you are, which is pretty neat uh, for a lot of the uh, threat actors that we're seeing and that we're interacting with. Um, as I said before, you'll see it again, Comedy Cash Out here. So Comedy Cash Out and Audi A6 Exchanger are both advertised. So my memory did serve me correctly. Comedy Cash Out is heavily advertised on Exploit. Uh, Audi A6 is heavily advertised on XSS. So what you have here is actually a list of their services. They'll exchange in directions from cash in to go to Bitcoin. They'll go from uh, Bitcoin to Kiwi. They'll go from Bitcoin, as you can see, I think the third one down, uh, Bitcoin to uh, QR Tinkov. And then you can also go to um, virtual credit cards, such as Visa or MasterCard issued virtual credit cards. You can go cash in from you know, a country, say you want to go cash in from Bulgaria and you want to cash out in somewhere like France or somewhere with a euro that has a more stable uh, form of currency. You are able to do that through one of these high risk exchanges. Um, and I want to highlight again through some of the sanctions that we've seen over the last kind of 24 months, the importance that these high risk exchanges play within the laundering and handling of illicit cryptocurrency. SUEX, CHATX, and GuaranteeX were all sanctioned by OFAC for handling funds from ransomware operators. So this has forced them to go other places. And they, um, we haven't confirmed that ransomware operators are using these new services, but we have seen these services pop up since these other ones have closed down. So again, it's cutting the head off the Hydra. You cut off one, more are going to appear, and that's what we have here. Um, and then again, most of these high-risk exchanges also offer mixing services that again, don't necessarily have a UI. You essentially go, hey, I have $30,000 in Bitcoin. I want you to start mixing it. Um, and we actually came across an actor. I was shocked. It was the largest amount that I've ever seen deposited on exploit. They had five Bitcoin deposited with the forum administrators to launder funds. They were like, hey, we're putting our money where our mouth is. We're putting down five Bitcoin, which I think if I'm doing the math correctly, was about sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 as of a couple weeks ago. And they said they would have their own liquidity pool. They can mix funds. They'll mix the minimum amount that you can start mixing with them, if I remember correctly, was about $50,000. So you had to have 50K to go to them and they would start mixing. And the crazy thing about it, they had several vouchers on the forum from individuals that were like, yes, they're good. We started using them. So if we want to go to the next slide here. So next uh we're going to go into some monetization methods um now that we have talked about um laundering and making your funds clean the next step that we have here let's take a drink real quick the next step in the process that we have here um which i didn't know about this until i started researching this topic more and more um we have virtual credit cards. So what these virtual credit cards are, are essentially cards that are issued by Visa or MasterCard through various services. Moon or Pay with Moon is one, Ezo card, VCC Pro and Waiver card are all virtual credit card um, providers. So again, they're not Visa or MasterCard, but they are issuing virtual credit cards that are Visa MasterCard. Um, if there's anyone, whether in the talk or in this room that works for Visa or MasterCard, I'd love to talk to you to kind of understand more of this process because this is an actual screen grab of a transaction that we did. We put $25 onto one card. We put $25 onto another card. We were just kind of attempting to see how this would work. Right here, we have, um, I blocked out the card number. I still think there's some money sitting on this card. It gives you a full 16 digit card number. It gives you an expiration. It gives you a CVV. Um, so it gives you all of the information that you would possibly need to be able to buy something online. Um, I won't give the name of the retailer. We tried one, the anti-fraud measures on that specific website kicked it back. 
but the next online retailer we went to and actually used this card worked. So again, if you are just trying to whether spend money or spend your illicit funds, this is a way to possibly cash out. You can also trade these as well. So say you put several thousand dollars on a VCC that you stole, say you put 10 grand on a virtual credit card. Hey, virtual credit card, $5,000, you get 10 grand for it, give me the funds and you get the card. So again, kind of similar to you know gift card fraud, things like that. Um, uh, next we have, I wanna make sure I covered everything here. Um, and next uh, we have the over-the-counter virtual credit card vendors. So these are like the very like shady back alley individuals. We see them on a lot of low tier forums like Nulled and Cracked. These are individuals that similar to over-the-counter exchanges where there's no UI, there's no pretty kind of um, web page for it. You have individuals on Nulled and Cracked and other low tier forums going, hey, if you give me funds, I'll give you a virtual credit card. Here's my fee for it. It's for individuals that kind of don't have the knowledge uh, or skills or abilities to understand that these other services exist. They're mainly scams and you're going to most likely get ripped off. Again, it's really kind of back alley, like trench coat type stuff of, hey, man, I, have, I can get this for you. You know, if you give me $50, I might be able to put it on the card. So, again, it's, it's low tier type stuff of the over the counter uh, type cards that we're seeing. Um, that are offering off of these websites. They may go through these websites if you actually get one, but it's not explicitly said. Uh, next slide, please. Awesome. So next, uh, you've heard me talk about over-the-counter uh, here a little bit. So over-the-counter uh, essentially is you dealing with somebody directly. So you know how I said peer-to-peer -peer markets uh, or peer-to-peer -peer exchanges before? This is kind of even more peer-to-peer -peer and more personal than over-the-counter or uh, than peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchanges. Over-the-counter is somebody literally posting an ad, whether it's on uh, Bitcoin Talk, whether it's on Null, whether it's on Crack, whether it's on Breach Forms too. Um, you kind of get the idea of kind of where we're seeing some of this stuff. Of hey, if you join my Telegram or Discord channel, I will act as an outside broker for you, and I will cash out or I will give you Bitcoin or any other type of crypto that you want. Some of them only deal in a few, but what we essentially have here is when you join this Telegram or Discord channel, you go, hey, um, I have $10,000 in Bitcoin. They'll go, okay, well, what do you wanna do with it? I wanna either convert it to fiat or I wanna convert it to uh, Monero or something else. I wanna start cleaning it. They go, okay, well, we can do that. Here is our fee. Uh, the Bitcoin that you give us, so that 10, it may only be worth five after the transaction. The fees are usually extremely high for these types of things uh, because usually what we're seeing with these is individuals that are using their own funds or a liquidity pool that they have acquired over time. So again, it's costing them money to do this essentially. Um, and then what we have is, as I said before, the fiat currency cash out services for individuals. This is where we see some of these uh, as well. So we see them on some of the high risk exchanges as well as some of the over the counter exchanges. So again, it's there's a lot of various um, elements to the high risk peer to peer and over the counter that sometimes the waters get muddied between all of them. Um, and it kind of took us a little bit of time to hash out and kind of clearly define where one might end, where one might cross over and one might uh, start. So, um, Next, we'll go into account verification services here. Uh, so what we have with these account verification services is you are getting a legitimate account that has been verified via Know Your Customer uh, validations. So what we have here is actually an ad from XSS. And what you have is this individual is saying, hey, I will go ahead and create you an account, whether it's on Wise, Coinbase, PayPal, Stripe, Revolut, uh, Binance, I will create you an account that will pass all identity checks, that will pass all uh, anti-money laundering checks. You won't get flagged. So what they're doing is they're bypassing it via whether it's identities that they've stolen, whether it is credentials. So I think driver's licenses, utility bills, things like that, things to prove identity that these platforms would use. 
Um, and then I won't get too much into it because we haven't done an extreme amount of research on it. In some cases, they're actually using AI to, they're sitting in front of their webcam because some of these services like Binance and Coinbase require you to move your head and move around and move an image. They're using AI to cover their face with the images that they've provided or the identity that they've created to be able to bypass some of this. I'm not going to go too, too much into it because we haven't done a ton of research on it yet, but it is something on the docket that we do want to work at. Um, next slide, please. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, go one back. I forgot to cover the uh, last part on that. So that wallet unblocking services, some of these accounts have guarantees. If your funds, when you attempt to cash them out or transfer them to another wallet, if for whatever reason they get flagged by uh, AML policies or they're, hey, this transaction looks suspicious, the threat actor will actually unblock it. We haven't really figured out how they do it, whether it's social engineering a customer service rep through the chat or calling them and say, hey, you can't do this. These are, you know, these are legitimate funds, this is a legitimate account. So again, we're working more kind of towards that on the research front to figure out more of the methodology of how they're even unblocking some of these funds. Um, and even if you have an account that you use legitimately that you didn't obtain through one of these account verification services, they're actually doing wallet unblocking services in general. So say I went to go, um, I had a, you know, a couple hundred bucks in a Coinbase account and I went to go withdraw and it got flagged and Coinbase refused to withdraw it on my behalf. I could go to one of these individuals who offer wallet unblocking services and they'll use their methods, uh, quote unquote, to unblock or be able to give me the funds within that account. So again, very kind of interesting, sometimes back alley type deals to even be able to get some of these funds out and get them moving. All right, next slide. So now that we move past the laundering and monetization, now we're going to go into some of the attack vectors and threats to crypto, NFTs, and smart contracts. So what we have here is by far the most prominent attack vector that we have covered over the past 16, 17 months that we've been doing these reports and this research. It is phishing and social engineering. Who would have thought? It's an oldie but goodie. It'll still continue to be abused. Um, what we have here um, over uh, the uh, on the left here and then down below the green and white, those are actually phishing pages that are targeting Coinbase. And then the other one is KuCoin. So these are essentially hooking up and we'll actually get to it in a little bit. Uh, these are actually hooking up to uh, malicious cryptocurrency drainers. So we'll go over drainers in a little bit. I just wanted to introduce them here. But some of the activities and themes that we're seeing specifically within the phishing and social engineering uh, space of things are airdrops. So what airdrops are, are, hey, I'm opening a new project. I'd really like for you to participate in it, or I'm dropping a new coin. I'm, I create a new coin. I want you to have some free cryptocurrency. And you go ahead and you go, okay, I want to accept it. However, when you go to accept the, the, uh, uh, the coin or whatever you're getting, the NFT, it actually connects, as we're going to cover in a little bit, a malicious drainer that actually drains all of your funds unknowing to you because you're just, hey, I like free things. Who doesn't like free stuff? And then you have credential theft. So that is what the, um, uh, uh, the screenshot directly below this paragraph is, the green and white one. So credential theft, um, again, oldie but goodie, it'll never stop being used. And if you actually get into a situation or when the threat actors get into a situation where they need 2FA, a lot of these models and a lot of these phishing panels actually have a 2FA built in. So what they're doing is they're seeing on the back end of their phishing panel, hey, this person entered their username, their password. Okay, cool, they hit next. Awesome, they even put in the 2FA code for me that they just got pushed to their phone. And I hurry up on the other end of this and log into their account on that end, hurry up, change the password, change the two-factor method, and then lock them out of the account. So that's the 2FA hijacking that we're seeing. Um, and then believe it or not, a lot of the official communication platforms for smart contracts and NFTs, specifically NFTs, are Discord servers, which is, again, wild to me that that is 
your official method of communication is join this Discord server. There's no way to necessarily validate who is setting them up sometimes. Um, and even Seth Green uh, fell for it. Um, there were, uh, he was a victim of a phishing scam um, where uh, phishing links were sent out to join the official uh, Board Ape Yacht, or they were sent out from the Board Ape Yacht Club official Instagram account. Seth Green clicked on it to log into his account to redeem whatever he wanted to redeem. And they actually stole a bunch of his board apes that he was using for a TV show that I think is on Hulu now, if I'm not mistaken. And he paid uh, 150, $160,000 to get this NFT back. So again, it's so mind bogglingly stupid to me that some of this stuff even exists. Um, and then again, we have other uh, wallets being compromised um, from other notable individuals who possess board ape yacht club uh, NFTs. So again, it's just it phishing and social engineering will never not work. Um, it will always work. You always make money off of it. There is something to be gained within that space. So if we want to go to the next slide, these are actually some examples of um, that one right there on the all the way on the right is actually a um, sample of a uh, airdrop. So this is what I mean. You can go ahead and redeem and kind of enter a crypto giveaway. You're actually giving that person permissions to take from your wallet. You're giving them complete control of your wallet when you go ahead and sign up for those. And then this was actually um, all the way on the left of the page here. This was actually a um, fishing panel um, in design that a individual was doing. Um, I want to say this was on XSS too. So you have various prices here. You have the landing page for an NFT generator. Um, these will actually go to eight sub pages so you can click through this and you know it looks very legit for $250 is your initial kind of upfront investment for a fishing page like this. Not bad, in my opinion, especially with some of the money some of these individuals are making off of these scams. Um, and if we want to go to the next slide. So what I want to cover here are in my opinion, um, two of the most notable attack vectors that we have come across in these last, again, uh, 16, 17 months of this research. Um, so we have continued to see things like this, and we have continued to see both cross-chain bridge attacks and drainers being some of the most popular attack vectors. So within uh, what a cross chain bridge is uh, for, I don't know if I put that in the definitions, I apologize if I didn't. So what a cross chain bridge is, it essentially connects two blockchains and that allows users to send crypto from one blockchain to the next. So if you wanna send Bitcoin to um, Ethereum or Bitcoin to Monero, you're able to convert that via a cross chain bridge. Um, so what we have here is uh, in 2022, the Ronin network was hit by uh, APT38, Blue North. They are a group of North Korean threat actors. And what we had here uh, was the compromise of private keys. So remember how I said private keys were essentially the keys to your house? What happened was uh, these individuals on behalf of APT38 sent uh, phishing emails to individuals that were working for the Ronin network. And to be able to validate transactions on the Ronin network and through that video game, so um, you needed five of nine validators. So five private keys had to sign out of nine to be able to authorize transactions. So they sent, they spammed out these phishing emails. They were able to compromise several keys at minimum five. And during this process, they were able to steal $600 million from Ronin, which was a video game kind of caricature game. And then they weren't able to steal and monetize all 600 million of it. They were only able to monetize, I think it was about three or 400 million, but if you have the basic of, or the bare minimum of a phishing email into this, and you just got a couple hundred million dollars out of it, that's not terrible. So we have, again, a method that is tried and true of phishing. They sent them to employees. And the similar thing happened to the Harmony blockchain. Uh, the Harmony uh, blockchain bridge 
uh, essentially bridged in-game currency to make transactions faster. So going from whether it was fiat to crypto or various other cryptos that were supported by Harmony. And again, the private keys were compromised within this, um, within this attack. And you had $100 million stolen, and that was by APT38. So just in 2022, you had almost $700 million uh, in losses attributed to APT38. So this is how North Korea is targeting the crypto space. And again, they've made out with several hundred million dollars of this. Quibit Finance um, was something similar. You had individuals who compromised private keys specifically for uh, that um, cross-chain bridge. So again, just alone in those attacks, you have almost a billion dollars worth of losses in 2022. I haven't even started to add the ones up for 23 yet because it we're just uh, over halfway through the year. But next, um, I wanna go over what uh, drainers are. So I've mentioned these quite a bit here. So in its most basic form, a cryptocurrency drainer specifically targets an individual's wallet and they are deployed through whether it is phishing links, um, whether it is the airdrop schemes and things like that, is a malicious program or malicious script that will target the um, victim's wallet and a lot of what we're seeing on the drainer side of things, they're targeting ECR20 based tokens. So remember anything that's on the Ethereum blockchain, including Ethereum, NFT, smart contracts. And then again, they're sent out via phishing emails and airdrops, and they specifically target uh, within these wallets, the set approval for all function. So who likes convenience? I like convenience. So the set approval for all function, is a convenience factor if you have ongoing transactions, you say, hey, I want this transaction to go through. I don't want to approve it every time. So these drainers specifically exploit that function and they just continue to take out of the wallet because no one is telling it to stop because you told it, do not stop these transactions. I don't want to approve them every time they're coming through. So I wish this was a little less blurry, but it's a nice pie chart that a threat actor put uh, on their drainer of why you should pick their drainer versus another drainer. Um, so what you have here, and I'm actually gonna attempt to uh, explain it. So what you have here for the red section, what it does when the victim connects their wallet, it'll scan it and say, hey, they, have, they do not have NFTs. Okay, so if they don't have NFTs, it goes up the red. Cool, does it have a SAFA function enabled? Yes, awesome, it has a SAFA function enabled. We're gonna scan it for other assets. Cool, it has Ethereum in it or it has Dogecoin in it. Awesome, we're going to target that and specifically start pulling those funds out. And then again, the right side of this where the green text is, hey, this individual has NFTs, awesome. We're not only gonna take the NFTs, we're also going to start taking the other assets in the wallet and draining them out to another wallet. So um, the most kind of targeted uh, on the NFT side of things that we've seen has specifically been through Seaport and OpenSea, which are exchanges that support NFTs um, and uh, mostly support the SAFA function where it's exploited. If we wanna go to the next slide here. All right. Next, we have one of my personal favorite attacks, uh, flash loans. Who here would give an uncollateralized loan? Who here would tell me, or who here would believe me when I'd be like, hey, I'm gonna pay you back. I just need $10,000. I don't have anything to give you, but I promise you I will pay it back. This is one of the most popular attack vectors we've seen in the decentralized finance space. So in the decentralized finance space, what that is, um, decentralized finance are essentially financial activities that are conducted outside of an intermediary, such as a bank, uh, or other established financial institution like a central bank or something like that. It's usually peer-to-peer -peer and software-based. Um, it includes borrowing, lending, uh, trading derivatives, insurance, and other things through smart contracts. That's the basis of what you have of flash loan attacks. So what we have here, um, I wanna go over two of the largest flash loan attack, or I'm sorry, one of the largest flash loan attacks that we saw. So going back to my point of uncollateralized loans. So what you have here is with Euler Finance, you had an individual who took out a flash loan. Uh, you had this individual who took out a flash loan for 
uh, about $30 million. Uh, I'm sorry, 30 million worth of DAI, which is a stable coin. They borrowed it through numerous flash loans, and then they deposited it into the Euler finance uh, market. And then the way the Euler finance market um, operates is Euler works on E tokens, which are collateral, and D tokens, which are debt. When there are more D tokens than E tokens, the platform starts to uh, liquidate its assets to even itself out. So this individual put in $30 million in, I'm sorry, they initially of the 30 million, they put in $20 million worth of the flash loan that they had taken out. So once that um, 30 million or 20 million was put in, they converted it to $19.5 million worth of EDI. So they were converting it to collateral. And the platform saw that I had, cool, I have a ton more collateral than I have debt at this point. We're good. Um, but there was a vulnerability within the platform that allowed that uh, user to um, take a, another flash loan out. So it triggered a uh, crash on liquidity within the platform. And because of the uh, vulnerability within the platform, when that person actually took out the another loan for 20 million, it gave them $195 million worth of token. And because they, and when they got that 195 million, they initially started to pay back the initial 30 million that they had taken. So that's what the 10 was set aside from the original 30. So you had the 30 broken to 20 and 10, and then the 10 was used to pay back uh, as well as some from the 195. And what they did was they started to pull the funds out because of the uh, vulnerability that they exploited. And they were able to steal 195 million because of that and because of that initial flash loan attack. Um, and then what you had was they went to Euler Finance and said, hey, we just did this. You know, We're gonna give you this back. We just want a little white hat, um, a little white hat fee for exploiting your platform. But they ended up getting the funds back. So $195 million was stolen. However, it was all given back to Euler Finance. If there's questions after, I can also attempt to explain it a little bit more. Um, but again, this is one of the more confusing, uh, at least for me, the most confusing parts of smart contract exploits is kind of understanding because it's usually numerous um, uh, attack vectors that they're leveraging as well as exploiting within this, um, uh, within this vector here. So next we have um, smart contract vulnerabilities. So within um, this specific smart contract vulnerability, the two that we've seen the most um, are price oracle manipulation and re-entrancy vulnerabilities. Um, so a price oracle is a outside platform that tells an exchange or another DeFi platform what a token is worth. So it's essentially a call out to a main um, kind of mother station or mother base of, hey, Bitcoin is worth this much right now. And it reports back to the exchange or platform. There's sometimes a delay in the reporting back, and that is where attackers will take advantage of specifically within the price oracle manipulation is they will take advantage of the delay in reporting of value. Um, so they'll either cause tokens to crash or go way up in value, depending on what they're specifically trying to do. And then you have a re-entrancy vulnerability. So what a re-entrancy vulnerability is in its most basic kind of concept or most basic understanding. Uh, it allows for repeated calls on a smart contract extract function uh, that allows for an attacker to drain all of the assets from that smart contract. So in it, again, kind of to reiterate for re-entrancy, so you are making a call on a smart contract. Hey, I want to close this out. I want to withdraw these funds. However, there's a vulnerability the re-entrancy vulnerability that allows for continued calls to take out more and more and more and more until it's all gone or till you feel that you've taken enough and then you can cancel it out. So the two uh, instances that I specifically wanna go over here, and I'm gonna kind of truncate these a little bit um, just to save on some time. So what we have here, um, Lodestar Finance uh, was a decentralized platform and going back to our old friend flash loans, there were flash loans used in this. Um, the attacker took out eight flash loans for about $71 million, and then they donated them to uh, Lodestar, 
which vastly inflated the price of the Plutus Vault GLP token, which is the platform's native token. Um, and then the attacker took out another flash loan and borrowed against this new valuation of it after uh, the price had increased. And the profits that they took from that token going way up after they artificially inflated the value of it, they started to pay back the $71 million across those eight other flash loans. Because if you don't pay that back, then yes, those cancel out and they, you do get a call back on that money at some point, but you don't have to put collateral up for them. And then after they paid back those initial flash loans, they were able to, they increased the value enough of the native token they were able to walk away with $7 million after they had paid back all of the other flash loans. It's not a bad take for some kind of, not necessarily basic knowledge, but it's not a bad take uh, for a day's work of $7 million. And next we have um, the DeForce Network. So this is a reentrancy vulnerability that occurred in February of this year, so just a few months ago. And again, going back to our tried and true, this is why I think flash loans are, again, fascinating to me. Um, we had a um, uh, we had a flash loan that was uh, taken out. Price orca manipulation was used to be able to um, uh, increase the value. And then what they did was, after that value was increased, they started to make a call on the initial funds that they put in to withdraw them out which allowed for that attacker after they increased the value to start withdrawing the funds via the smart contract that they had. Um, so what they had was they essentially staked their cryptocurrency with DeForce. So they entered into a smart contract with them of, hey, I want to lend you money, pay me either interest or derivative on it. So they're like, yes, sure, we will do that. They put it in and then the value of the token increased and they made a call back, hey, I wanna withdraw. And they did it all within a few hours and that allowed them to just continue to withdraw and withdraw and withdraw until there were no more funds left in the liquidity pool because of this vulnerability. Um, and again, we had some nice uh, individuals that attacked this. They gave all of the money back that they stole for a small fee. So again, it's you know seeing the extortion part of it as well as the technical abilities to even begin to start exploiting some of these vulnerabilities. Next slide, please. So I want to go through this um, relatively quickly as well. Um, so what we have here are API withdrawals. So some of the cryptocurrency exchanges that are well known, uh, Binance, Crypto.com, uh, Coinbase, you can use an API to withdraw and handle funds. Everyone knows if you compromise an API key or if an API key is compromised, it's, it's, it's a risk. Um, it can be exploited. So that's what's happening here is you have individuals that are offering services to whether it's compromise or obtain API keys for various accounts. If you are a user that you know takes part in withdrawing via an API key, um, that could be a risk possibly for you because there are threat actors attempting to at least target this that we've seen. Um, two of the more popular uh, attacks that we've seen in this space, uh, one was the three commas vulnerability, I'm sorry, the three commas attack um, where this user on social media deleted their account. We couldn't uh, grab the account, but there were screenshots of it. Posted 10,000 API keys from three commas. And they initially have said that they have about 100,000 more API keys coming that would be able to take all of the funds out of that specific, uh, to take all the funds out of three commas. So again, you have this method to withdraw through API that is now being uh, abused and at least targeted by threat actors. And you have Scrooge API, who is a threat actor on, I think it's XSS, if I'm not mistaken, that offers this type of service of, hey, if you either can give me an API key for an exchange, or if I can compromise API keys for you, I will continue to withdraw on them. And they actually offered withdrawal services for Finance, Digit, Bitrix, KuCoin, uh, Gate, OKX, Kraken. So again, some of the more popular exchanges out there. And once they are withdrawn, uh, Scrooge API takes about 50%, 50 to 60%, depending on how much they actually are able to withdraw. And next slide, please. So these two uh, methods uh, within the attack 
in uh, attack vectors and threats, rug pull and pig butchering. So these are not as technically savvy as kind of some of the other methods. These are more on the social engineering side of things, more on the phishing side of things. Um, the reason Jake Paul uh, is on there, I think that's Jake Paul. I, I don't care to know what he looks like or even what he does at this point. Um, the reason he's up there with um, what looks like, if I'm remembering my Pokemon correctly, Venusaur or Bulbasaur, I think. Um, you have uh, what was Animoon, which was a NFT project. So what they did in this rug pool was they raised all of these funds. And this is kind of the general theme for rug pools. They hype up a project. They get individuals like Jake Paul to speak about it. They get clothing designers to make things for it. They hype up the project. They get individuals to invest in it. And then they go silent. And in this certain or in this specific case, they were able to steal about $6.3 million that individuals had invested in this project initially. It was meant to be kind of similar to a Pokemon trading. Uh, and, you know, you get specific NFTs of like, hey, I traded you for this uh, Anti-Moon character. I now have an NFT for it. And then you can trade those back and forth between users. And the developers of this project, again, hyping it up, they got these celebrities, clothing developers uh, and designers to, you know, put effort into making it seem legit and they didn't know any better. And then one day on Discord, they deleted the channel, deleted all of the admins, and then all of the funds were gone and started to be mixed and laundered through other means. So again, that is kind of the basics of a rug pull. Um, some technical skill is needed. Uh, however, it usually takes you know weeks and months to kind of develop that kind of scam. Um, and then we're seeing more and more, I think I actually got a notification on my phone this morning uh, going into pig butchering. It was you, yes, I think it was you that posted something on LinkedIn uh, this morning and we're seeing more and more of these pig butchering scams. So this is kind of an oldie but goodie, but now reimagined for cryptocurrency. So think investment and romance scams specifically for these ones. Um, what we have specifically on the investment side of things is liquidity mining. So you have these individuals that are saying, hey, if you invest in my specific platform or if you invest in my specific, whether it's token or something else, we'll give you returns on that. And then they convince that individual to whether it's connect their wallet or deposit funds over time, they'll start to see some return on investment of like, hey, I'm making, you know, a couple hundred bucks or a couple hundred dollars back a month. And then that individual, again, will just pull it out and butcher the pig because that individual keeps putting money into it every month because they're seeing small returns. And after it's, you know, kind of to a point where the threat actor sees this person's invested four or $5,000, let's cut it now. And they do this across individuals. Um, just in, recently in one of the reports that we did, I couldn't believe I was writing it. In, Nor or in South Korea, someone created a pig butchering scam for older individuals to invest in dog wrinkle identification. You could identify your dog based on the wrinkles in their nose. Who would invest in this? They made off with several million dollars of these individuals' funds. Again, wild. I never thought I would write that or have to explain that. It was baffling to me. Um, and you have the romance scam. Um, so kind of, again, oldie but goodie in that sense of, I really love you. I need you to send me some money so I can get some gifts or, you know, you need to show me that you love me, um, things like that. Again, typical romance scam and the individual keeps kind of milking them for money, um, getting uh, crypto out of them. I don't know why you would send the love of your life or someone that you love crypto. I think flowers may suffice or other things, but uh, we see cryptocurrency being constantly donated uh, specifically through some of these romance pig butchering scams. And next, um, I just want to go through um, looking to the future a little bit here. So in terms of all of the, I know I only have like two minutes left, in terms of looking to the future and the laundering and monetization piece of it, with all of the recent OFAC sanctions, as well as the crackdowns from FDX or FTX, and extra eyes from law enforcement, regulators, and policymakers on the space, it's possible that threat actors and other individuals who have illicit crypto may just sit on it at this point and not do anything with it for a little bit, not attempt to launder it, clean it, or obfuscate it. Um, and then we may have 
uh, other individuals coming up with new and improved laundering and storage methods. So it kind of the necessity breeds um, uh, breeds improvement and breeds creativity uh, and breeds innovation. So we may have something in that space, um, which would lead us to better cash out and monetization methods that we're unable to keep track of. Um, and that may mean moving more things to Monero. There was a recent update with Monero that actually makes it even more uh, anonymized than it was before. Uh, it went from eight to 16 nodes of anonymization. So when you initially took out Monero, it went through eight individuals. Now it goes through 16 different nodes. So it's even harder to track or even attempt to be able to track down. Um, and then in terms of attacks and threats, um, I can almost guarantee you're going to see more phishing and social engineering based attacks. There's kind of going to be no shortage of those because of the amount of money that is being made off of them. Someone just made several million dollars off telling you your dog's nose can be identified through a project. I mean, again, we're going to continue to see more and more of it. Um, the development uh, of more uh, sophisticated vulnerabilities. So individuals picking apart smart, smart contracts more. Uh, as all of us know in this room and on the call, when you have a new technology, individuals and hackers and exploiters will pick it apart and find absolutely everything they can until it can be improved. And we're not seeing that. There are still millions of dollars in loss attributed to smart contract um, uh, vulnerabilities. And uh, I wish my fourth point wasn't true, but we just saw another attack uh, that was attributed to APT38, so North Korean Threat Actor Group, for atomic wallets. They were able to compromise and steal several million dollars from atomic wallets. Uh, it's just another hot wallet type deal. And then lastly, um, to be able to kind of combat and look into the space a little more, having this type of research done, having the individuals that are subject matter experts in these various attack vectors to be able to, whether it's drive future policy, inform individuals that are working for some of these firms like Coinbase or Binance, or even the banks to say, hey, it has to touch this bank at some point. This, is, may, this may be kind of the precursor markers that you can look for. Um, and then again, the enforcement actions, I think we're going to see more and more, especially uh, in light of FTX. So I appreciate everyone's time. Um, and if anyone has any questions, um, you can uh, hit me up on Twitter at Sam underscore Clazy um, or uh, via Recorded Future. Thank you all. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, please bring them up now. Uh, yeah. After this, uh, hold on a second. After this uh, presentation, we've got a short break, and the next presentation will begin at uh, 9.05. So please ask your questions now. Hi, I was a... Uh... I was curious, kind of like, where do you see this going in a few years? I mean, I feel like the reputation of a lot of uh, these crypto firms have kind of taken a hit with the fall of FTX and uh, yeah. Celsius and, and others. I mean, do you see this as kind of like a still a growing problem or one that's more on, on the wane? So uh, the question was for individuals in the room, um, what is possibly the future of some of these platforms like FTX and uh, um, what is some of the, I'm sorry, let me rephrase what, or let me uh, clarify what he said. So what is the future of crypto based on some of the fallout of FTX um, and possibly where it may go? Um, kind of seeing what, uh, you know, we've, uh, reviewed and researched and analyzed over the last several months, uh, specifically in the fallout of FTX. Um, I think it is losing a lot of kind of mainstream um, steam in terms of individuals that are picking it up. I think a lot of individuals see it as risky. I think the kind of whistle has been blown on a lot of these things may be scams. However, that does not you know, kind of stop the illicit or criminal activity that is happening. So while it may not be mainstream, I definitely think it's going to continue to grow specifically within, you know, I hate to say it, the cyber underground or illicit activities. Um, you're not going to see ransomware groups walk away from crypto because FTX fell uh, or because there may be more regulations in the U.S. Um, and I think that is a hard uh, problem to solve because cryptocurrency in and of itself is not meant to be held by regulation, which has 
the regulation that's in place has forced other things. And this is kind of where I see it going more and more, specifically in light of FTX and more regulation, going to these um, over-the-counter exchanges, going to peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. Cool, if I can't do it through Binance or one of the other you know, verified exchanges, I'll go do it another way. I will get my funds some way or another, whether it is off the record or on the record, or hell, even abusing the account verification process to even get accounts on these. So I think FTX is forcing more regulation and light on the issue, which I think is causing individuals within the space, especially the illicit space, to go more underground and to operate more peer-to-peer -peer and find more creative ways. So I think it might be done in the mainstream for just a little bit until kind of people forget that this happened. Mm -hmm. So they're still going to use it as a, not as an investment, but as a means of change. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And then uh, I think, what do I, I think there was a question in the room of what do I think of SBF? Uh, I, I, I think he's a, a very creative con man. Uh, and I think that is kind of even more brought to life by the fact that he just violated the conditions of his bail by intimidating witnesses, and he was just sent back to prison uh, for that. So I think he's going to attempt to lie, cheat, and steal his way out of this problem like he already did, which kind of caused him all of the issues that he has. Any other questions from the room? So the the uh, the question and uh, for individuals on in the VR room is price oracle manipulation illegal? To my knowledge, no. I'm I'm not a lawyer. I have not seen anything illegal about it. Um, I think the yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's a lot like arbitrage or arbitrage. I'm sorry, uh, arbitrage, um, uh, arbitrage. Um, I think you're going to see a lot more of it because I don't know if anyone went to the policy talk yesterday um, of the individuals that were talking about kind of the various pieces of cyber that DDoS is not illegal. It doesn't violate any US criminal law. Um, it's not in violation of the um, Electronic Device Act or anything like that. However, I think you're going to see more and more theft from it, which may prompt, uh, you know, whether it's more regulation or more law uh, towards that. So again, to my knowledge, it is not legal, and that's why it is being abused uh, in so many instances that we're seeing. Any other questions, Joe? So of that 600 million from Ronin that was taken, um, if I'm remembering correctly, I think about two to three hundred million dollars of it was started to be mixed actually through Tornado Cash and Blender. Uh, which was part of the OFAC sanction and was actually mentioned within the um, OFAC big sanctions list of we're sanctioning you because of X, Y, and Z. Um, of that, uh, I think about three, four hundred million dollars of it was frozen um, by Ronin and other exchanges like Binance and Crypto.com. So those funds are essentially dead um, when they were attempted to be moved. So again, they were still able to get some money out of it, not everything that they had initially taken. Any other questions in the room? Virtually or in person? All right. Thank you everyone for joining and listening to me ramble for an hour. Uh, it is much appreciated and hope to do it again next year, possibly. Thanks, Sam. It was a great talk. I uh, really enjoyed it. And yeah, we'll reach out to you again. Absolutely. Thanks a lot.